Hi there, my name is What is Moo, and this is part three of my multi-part field guide to the Soviet army. I'm going to have to apologize for the slight delay in my uh, anti-schedule. It turns out that a uh, grad school is a, <laughs> a lot of work. With that said, it is a dark and occasionally stormy night here in the research Sharashka, so we'll be covering anti-aircraft and anti-tank systems. A number of these are going to be famous, or perhaps infamous, from various non-specific armored vehicle-themed games who shall remain nameless, but like an Imperial Japanese Army officer at a war crimes tribunal, I'm here to tell you not to believe the lying gaijin. But first, since apparently it works better at the front of videos, like, comment, and subscribe. The Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact made a very large number of anti-aircraft and anti-tank systems during the Cold War. In the first part of this guide, I said that the USSR was an artillery army with a lot of tanks. This is certainly the case, but Soviet artillerists did a great deal more than just firing howitzers. From the control bunkers of the ballistic missiles of the strategic rocket forces, to the firing cabs of Air Defense Force surface-to-air missile sites, and behind the shields of army anti-tank guns, the crossed cannons of the artillery were everywhere in the Soviet military. The Soviets were well aware of the importance of tanks and aircraft in modern battle, and developed myriad systems to defeat these potent threats. They had so many different anti-aircraft and anti-tank systems, often each with several sub-variants, that each one could be an hour-long deep dive in and of itself. If you're looking for someone to wax rhapsodically about the technical minutiae of every nut and bolt on each gun, missile, or vehicle in the Soviet military and the Warsaw Pact, you won't find that here. Likewise, you won't find any great secrets of the universe in this video. I'm working from open sources, publicly available information that is, a list of which is in the description or a pinned comment below, whichever has more space to write. What this guide will tell you, however, is what these systems were designed to do, the roles they filled, and where they fit into the Soviet concept of anti-aircraft or anti-tank defense, and how to quickly visually identify them. Think less, this missile will penetrate so many millimeters of armor at this many degrees, and more, this missile will knock out tanks A and B from all angles, but likely only defeat tank C from the sides and rear. Combat, especially the modern combined arms combat of World War II and beyond, is incredibly complex. This is doubly true of anti-aircraft warfare, where there's not only the technical question of how to hit a target moving in three dimensions with a missile moving in three dimensions, but there's the black box of radio-electronic battle or as we call it in the West, electronic warfare. I don't know the great secrets of the universe. I can't tell you the intricate details of these radar systems, how they process signals, or how electronic countermeasures or electronic counter-countermeasures work. For all I know, electronic warfare systems might as well be magic. That is the brevity code for them. Electronic warfare being a black box poses a problem, though, because radar and radios and other uses of the electromagnetic spectrum are the cornerstone of modern air and anti-air warfare. So, caveat emptor, buyer beware. This guide is descriptive. It exists to introduce you, dear viewer, to the common variants of the Cold War, Soviet, and Warsaw Pact threat systems, to help identify the major variants thereof, and to dispel the fog of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that surrounds the equipment of the Soviet Army and Warsaw Pact. With that note out of the way, let's dive into the first half of today's video, anti Anti-Aircraft Systems Part 1. Anti-Aircraft Systems During the Cold War, the 45 years of global tension lasting from about 1946 to about 1991, the Soviet Army was deeply influenced by their experiences during the 1941-45 Nazi-Soviet conflict, what they call the Veliki Otechistvonaya Vojnya, the Great Patriotic War. In 1941, the Red Air Force was brutalized in the opening hours and days of Operation Barbarossa, and the RKKA, the Workers and Peasants Red Army, had to claw air superiority back from the fascist invaders through years of hard fighting. Soviet pilots and gunners were, of course, assisted in this task by the wholesale slaughter of the Luftwaffe by the Western Allies in the Mediterranean theater and during the bomber offensive over Germany. After the war, the RKKA, renamed the Soviet Army in 1946, kept a healthy appreciation of the necessity of robust organic air defenses, both for maneuver units in the field and to defend strategically important targets at home. Soviet emphasis on air defense persisted throughout the whole of the Cold War. By the late 1970s, Soviet estimates placed over half of NATO's battlefield firepower in its air arm, and the ever-present threat of Strategic Air Command's B-52s hung like a sword of Damocles over Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, Sverdlovsk, Alma-Ata, and the hundreds of other cities in the Soviet Union. In the Soviet view, air defense was a critical task through the whole of the Cold War. In the 1950s and 60s, NATO's fast jets and missiles carried the terrible power of the atom to the battlefield. 
As the 1970s turned to the 1980s, this shifted. New high-technology weapons, many delivered by air, used precision to give conventional bombs similar battlefield capability to smaller tactical nuclear weapons without the risk of the apocalypse. In the face of this constant threat from the skies, the Soviets developed a large number of anti-aircraft systems. To organize our discussion, this section will be divided into a few categories. First is flak guns, or towed anti-aircraft artillery. After that will be static missile systems, and then self-propelled gun and gun missile systems, followed by mobile missile systems, and finally man-portable air defense systems, or man pads. It's important to understand that, as mentioned in the introduction, the range of surface-to-air missile systems varies widely depending on how it's defined. The range of a missile system against a target flying straight and level towards the launcher at medium altitude without jamming or evasive maneuvers is going to be much longer than that of a target flying evasively at low level, employing electronic warfare systems, etc. Therefore, I'll usually be describing SAM ranges qualitatively, by role and use, rather than by so many kilometers. Where I do give a range, it is nominal and only applies for a perfectly spherical missile in a frictionless vacuum. If you want to know the actual performance, the best I can tell you is to go join the Air Force and be a wild weasel. Flak, Towed Anti-Aircraft Artillery. Instead of explaining how to skeet shoot metal birds, I'm going to take some time to explain the fundamental principles of a Cold War era Soviet integrated air defense system. Note that while this explanation should apply to Soviet and Warsaw Pact forces from about the late 1950s through roughly the end of the Cold War in 1991, it does not apply to any other time or group. The creation of an integrated air defense system is a complex problem that many forces have solved in outwardly similar but crucially different ways. The Soviets created an IADS, integrated air defense system, to function within their concept of war and how to fight it and to defend against the threats the Soviet military would face. Other militaries, such as the North Vietnamese, Iraqis, or even the United States Navy, created their own integrated air defense systems with their own understanding of war, ways of fighting, and to defend against the threats they expected. While the Soviet and United States Navy air defense systems for example, might be outwardly similar, it's important to understand the subjects of our analysis in their own contexts. You wouldn't want to be a passenger on an Airbus whose pilot is only trained to fly Boeings. The first two concepts of Cold War era Soviet integrated air defense systems are that air defense is an integral part of the combined arms team and that it uses a broad array of systems and capabilities to execute its mission, the protection of the ground forces. The protection of the ground forces is completed whether they destroy or cripple an enemy aircraft, prevent enemy air crews from carrying out their attacks, or force enemy air crews to expend their ordnance without hitting targets. To achieve this, action is conducted in three overlapping and potentially simultaneous phases. Phase 1 is striking enemy aircraft on their airfields and in marshalling areas, and is conducted primarily by strike aircraft and missiles. Phase 2 is action taken to destroy enemy aviation assets while they are some distance away from friendly, i.e. Soviet, ground forces. This would primarily be conducted by Soviet and Warsaw Pact air forces, though also longer-range anti-aircraft missiles would play a role. Finally, Phase 3 is the destruction of enemy aircraft and other strike means such as helicopters and missiles while they're in proximity to friendly Soviet ground forces. This is primarily conducted by the tactical air defenses of Soviet and allied ground forces and is where most of the systems we'll be discussing today would be found. The Soviets described seven principles of air defense in the late Cold War. Firepower, surprise, mobility and maneuver, continuous activity, aggressive action, initiative and originality, coordination of actions, and all-around security. First is firepower. By possessing diverse and plentiful anti-aircraft weapons, Soviet commanders possess the required tools to solve the battlefield problems they will face. Surprise. The physical and psychological effects of violent and unexpected attack increase the effect of that attack multiplicatively. Surprise attack at critical moments can cause outsized effects in attacking aircrew. 3. Mobility and maneuver. Air defenses must be able to keep pace with tactical maneuver elements, and by skilled maneuver, such as taking an unexpected position, may inflict surprise on enemy air crews. 4. Continuous activity. Air defense coverage must be comprehensive and continuous. Day or night, fair or foul weather, in conditions of radioelectronic combat and the chaos of battle, air defenses must always protect maneuver forces. Aggressive action, initiative, and originality. 
To fully exploit the potential of their equipment, air defense commanders and crews must act with aggression, initiative, and originality. Passive reaction to enemy threats will result in being overwhelmed. Initiative, in the Soviet view, is the prompt and flexible response to situational changes to ensure the expression of the higher commander's will. Finally, the modern battlefield is increasingly intolerant of stereotype. Commanders must be creative and original in their use of forces, not simply applying rote memorized school book answers. 6. Coordination of actions. Air defense units must coordinate with the unit they are part of or supporting, as well as neighboring and higher air defense units. The entire military system must be working in concert, as each musician in an orchestra forms an integral part, but the symphony is more than the sum of its parts. 7. All-around security. The range and capability of modern aircraft mean that attacks may come from any direction at any depth. As a result, air defenses must provide security from all directions and throughout the whole depth of the forces, from the front lines to the rear areas. In short, Soviet air defense forces during the Cold War understood that control of the air can make or break a decisive advance, and that no system is a silver bullet on its own. An aircraft penetrating a notional block of Soviet forces arrayed on a flat plane 70 kilometers wide and 350 50 kilometers deep at 300 feet altitude would be engaged approximately once every 1.2 kilometers. The Soviets understood that the most adept air defense system was the one which combined large numbers of high-quality anti-aircraft complexes with a clear and coordinated system to command and control them. The performance of each individual system in a vacuum is more than irrelevant, it's actively misleading. Having discussed the principles of an integrated air defense system, let's shift back to our discussion of towed anti-aircraft guns. First is the 12.7mm Dushka on Czechoslovak quad mount VZ-53. Uh, this is a quad mount for the Soviet DSHKM 12.7mm machine gun. It has an effective slant range of about 1000 meters against air targets and 2500 meters against land targets. Ammunition is supplied in non-disintegrating belts, 50 rounds per gun. The distinguishing features are the four visible drums to hold the belts, the two-wheeled carriage, and the distinctive muzzle brake of the DSHK. It was introduced in 1953 and saw service in the Czechoslovakian army until the introduction of man pads, as well as a reasonable export success, notably to Cuba and the Arab states. The 14.5mm KPV machine gun on single, twin, and quad mounts. The ZPU series are a number of mounts for the KPV 14.5mm heavy machine gun. Each mount has an effective firing range of 1400 meters and carries 150 rounds per gun, give or take. The cyclic rate of fire is around 600 rounds per minute per gun, with a continuous rate of fire of about 150 rounds per minute per gun. Aiming is by optical sights with train and elevation by hand wheels. First is the ZPU-1. It's a single mount for the KPV. It is a two-wheeled carriage, and the gunner is seated on the port side of the mount with the standard 150 round belt box. Note the circular base when dismounted from the carriage. Next, we have the ZGU-1, a specialized mountain warfare model, which disassembles into man-packable loads of no more than 40 kilograms. This wasn't adopted by the Soviet Union, but was widely used by communist forces in the Vietnam War. It has a smaller 70-round belt, and the main distinguishing feature is the tripod base and the seat directly behind the gun. The standard twin mount is the ZPU-2. This has a two-wheeled carriage that dismounts for firing. The main distinguishing feature is that the belt boxes have the narrow side facing forwards, and it's a twin mount. The lightened airborne version of the twin mount is the ZU-2. This is very similar in performance to the ZPU-2, but it is lighter and the ammo boxes have the wide part facing forwards. Finally, the ZPU-4 is the quad mount on a four-wheeled carriage, Note the large square ammunition boxes, four barrels, and four wheels. The ZU-23-2 is a 23mm twin-barrel anti-aircraft mount on a two-wheeled carriage. It may also be mounted en porte on a truck or armored vehicle. This mount was introduced in the mid-1950s and is very widely proliferated. The rate of fire is around 1,000 rounds per minute per gun cyclic, with each gun firing from a 50-round belt. The effective engagement range is about 2,500 meters against air targets, and it is an incredibly prolific weapon, uh, which can often but not always be identified by the big can-shaped muzzle devices, the two barrels and the two seats at the back. It has seen prolific use in the Middle East and other theaters, especially by non-state actors on improvised mountings. The 30mm PLDVK VZ-5359 
is a Czechoslovakian twin barrel 30 millimeter anti-aircraft gun on a four wheeled carriage. Each barrel fires at around 500 rounds per minute cyclic from 50 round magazines. The engagement envelope is a 2000 meter slant range, uh, but it is mainly found on the motorized chassis that will be described later. Moving up in caliber, we have the 37 millimeter M1939. Introduced in, funnily enough, 1939, this 37 millimeter automatic anti-aircraft gun has an effective slant range of 3,500 meters and fires at 180 rounds per minute cyclic and 80 rounds per minute sustained. There is, as far as I know, no provision for radar fire control in Soviet versions. It was produced in large numbers in the Soviet Union as well as uh, communist China. 37 millimeter M1939 basically looks and performs somewhere around a contemporary Bofors L60. This is primarily because it is a derivative of the original L60 Bofors design. The Soviet designers themselves felt no special need to reinvent the wheel, but like most adopters of the Bofors 40 millimeter, fiddled with it to production optimize it and suit local conditions. The 57 millimeter S60 anti-aircraft complex with 57 millimeter anti-aircraft gun AZP-57 was adopted in 1950. The S60 is a 57 millimeter anti-aircraft gun system that combines the Puazo 5 or 6 gun lane computer, the WIF fire can or flap wheel radars, and 57 millimeter AZP-57 automatic cannons. The automatic cannons have a rate of fire of 120 rounds per minute cyclic per barrel and a range of 4,000 meters on optical training and 6,000 meters when used with the fire control radar. The Puazo 5 and 6 are optical fire control systems that integrate electromechanical computers and optical range finders to generate fire control information for anti-aircraft guns, which have all broadly been superseded by radar gun layers. WIF, or SON4, is the immediate post-war fire control radar, likely a copy of SCR-584 or derived from it. It was superseded quickly by FireCan or SON-9. FireCan or SON-9 and SON-9A is perhaps the most ubiquitous fire control radar for anti-aircraft artillery. It saw really extensive use in the Vietnam War and is very widely proliferated. It is also horribly, horribly outdated at any point beyond the 1960s or 70s. The Flap Wheel is a slightly newer uh, radar. It's known to the Soviets as RPK-1 or SON-50, and it's a multi-purpose radar fire control system for the S-60 as well as other guns. It's more technically advanced than FireCan, and it is self-propelled, but it's still very outdated by any sort of modern standard. The 57mm VZ-CS or VZ-7S or R-10 is a Czechoslovakian 57mm automatic anti-aircraft cannon that's basically identical in performance to the familiar Soviet S-60, but was produced in far smaller numbers, perhaps a couple hundred. It doesn't actually fire interchangeable ammunition with the S-60, but does fire somewhat faster at 180 rounds a minute. The associated radar is dome glass, but it can still use fire can. Basically, think of it as yet another instance of Czechoslovakian arms industry trying to be special snowflakes for reasons of national pride and then failing to get any significant export sales for want of having any real improvement over cheaper Soviet models. The next gun up in caliber is the 100mm KS-19. This is a pretty common 100mm anti-aircraft gun with a rate of fire of 10 to 15 rounds a minute. Effective fire range with on-carriage laying equipment is 3,500 meters, expanded to 12.6 kilometers cross range and 13.7 kilometers altitude when used with the WIF or fire can radar. Optical training is also available using the Puazo 6 or Puazo 7. The big brother to the KS-19 is the 130 millimeter KS-30. KS-30 is a Soviet 130 millimeter towed anti-aircraft gun from the early 50s and its performance is ballistically pretty similar to the 120mm M1 anti-aircraft gun of the United States. Fire Wheel, or SOM-30, is a derivative of WIF or Fire Can dating to the 1950s that is exclusively associated with the 130mm KS-30 and the related visual trainer, Puazo-30. Finally, we have my absolute favorite towed anti-aircraft gun we're going to be discussing today, the KM-52. The 152mm KM-52 was a Soviet 152mm 57.5 caliber towed anti-aircraft gun produced in very, very small numbers in the mid-1950s. 
it looks broadly like an upsized KS-30 and was supposed to fire rocket-assisted shells. 16 were produced before it was cancelled in favor of surface-to-air missiles, and I'm bringing this up despite my rule against esoteric and obscure prototypes because I think this gun is absolutely hilarious. The KM-52 is a patently absurd system. The design requirements called for a muzzle velocity of 1,030 meters a second, firing a 49 kilo shell at a rate of fire greater than 10 rounds a minute. In testing, it managed to fire 17 rounds a minute. The gun weighed about as much as an IS-3 heavy tank, fired about as fast as the auto-loaded 6-inch guns on the Worcester-class light cruiser, but was more powerful with a heavier shell than the Worcesters and a muzzle velocity higher than the M16A1 assault rifle. Needless to say, this patently ridiculous gun was too pure for this world, and development ended before they even finished making the radar for it. That wraps up the Toad anti-aircraft gun, and we're going to segue quickly into the slightly more technically advanced realm of static guided missile systems. As technology progressed, gun-based anti-aircraft systems gave way to surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs. Soviet SAMs were continually upgraded during their service lives, and so missile performance changed radically as time went on. Several of these systems were very widely exported and saw active combat service to mixed results. Keep in mind that weapons are only so good as the people who use them, and that warfare does not consist of perfectly spherical systems jousting in a frictionless vacuum. The name of the game for air defense is depth and integration, weaving a web of overlapping long, medium, and short range as well as point defense weapons tied together with a coherent early warning and battle management system. The first Soviet SAM system to see service, say that five times fast, was the SA-1 Guild. The Soviet designation was S-25 Berkut, or uh, Golden Eagle. This was a static, strategic SAM system, which was based around Moscow and Leningrad entering service in the late 1950s. The system was of limited utility, only able to engage non-maneuvering subsonic bomber-type targets at medium altitude and a nominal maximum range of 35 kilometers. This was upgraded throughout the life of Guild, but the system was never widely exported. Indeed, it appears the only export customer was North Korea. Nuclear-tipped variants were produced and deployed. Guild can be visually identified by the static vertical launch system, the large triangular clipped fins with small canards at the nose. The associated radar for SA-1 Guild is the Yo-Yo radar. It's a static, incredibly large radar consisting of two spinning triangular antennas. It was only deployed near Moscow and Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. The first widely deployed Soviet SAM system was the SA-2 Guideline. Guideline, known to the Soviets as the S-75 series, was initially an improved but still bomber-only medium-range system. It notably shot down at least three U-2 reconnaissance aircraft, a 56 66 91 flown by Jack Chang, 56 66 76 flown by Rudolf Anderson, and 56 66 93 flown by Francis Powers. Guideline was exported extensively and has seen a number of upgrades. Key identification of guideline sites is the distinctive Star of David pattern, though this may not always be present. Nuclear-tipped variants were produced and deployed. Guideline can be distinguished by the single-rail trainable launcher, the narrow fuselage, and two pairs of very large triangular fins. Fansong, the radar associated with Guideline, is perhaps the most iconic Soviet fire control radar. Fansong consists of a control cabin, a horizontal arm with between one and three dishes, and a vertical arm. There are a ton of variants, at least A through F, but by modern standards, they are very known quantities. Spoonrest is a prolific late 1950s vintage early warning and target acquisition radar, which takes the form of a number of Yagi antennas, think like an old satellite TV antenna, on a stick coming out of the top of a truck. They also spin. The name is an allusion to the earlier mid-1950s knife rest, which Spoon Rest replaced as an early warning radar starting in 1956. Spoon Rest is part of the Utensil Rest family of antennae, alongside Knife Rest, the preceding radar, Prong Rest, and Fork Rest, which are two VHF antennae for the R122 radio. Fork Rest was initially misidentified as a meter band search radar, but this is now known not to be the case. The next Soviet surf air missile system is the SA-3 Goa. The Goa is a short-range static SAM system designed to complement guideline and guild as a close-in defense against low-flying or maneuvering targets, such as NATO attack aircraft like the USAF's F-105 Thunderchief or the Luftwaffe's F-104G. 
When introduced, it was quite capable against maneuvering targets relative to Guideline or Guild, but has since been superseded by far more capable systems. Goa has been widely exported and is distinguished by the two or four rail trainable launcher and the four large square fins on the thicker first stage. Low Blow is the fire control radar for the SA-3 Goa. It's distinctively shaped in that it's two antennas making a V with a square dish in front of them and one between them. The reporting name is due to Low Blow's inclusion of an MTI, or Moving Target Indicator, which allows the radar to filter moving targets from static background returns. This is not a pulse Doppler radar, but does give a similar capability to filter out ground clutter. Flat Face is a two-dimensional azimuth and range early warning radar generally associated with the SA-3, but variants were used with later missiles. Flat face is identifiable because it has two oval concave dishes on a mast sticking out of a truck. They do spin. This was later replaced with squat eye, which mounts a single, more circular antenna on a tall, skinny mast. The SA-3 also used spoon rest, which was discussed previously. The final Soviet fully static missile system was SA-5 Gammon. SA-5 Gammon, or the S-200 missile family, is the successor to Guild and Guideline in the strategic static air defense role. Gammon is a massive, very long-range missile capable of engaging targets from low to high altitude. It has a large, powerful, conventional, or nuclear warhead and was widely exported to Warsaw Pact and Soviet-aligned states. Gammon is visually identified by its size, the four booster rockets, the trainable single launchers, and cruciform delta wing plan form. The square pair is the fire control radar for SA-5 Gammon. It is incredibly visually distinctive, consisting of a long trailer cab with a cruciform trail, think like on the Flak 88, and two big antennas. Tall King is the two-dimensional azimuth and range early warning radar associated with SA-5 Gammon. It is a very large oval-shaped radar antenna that spins on a big low-loader style trailer. There is also the scoreboard A or B and 1L22-73E6 parole or password IFF system that is used alongside it. These are secondary radars and of lesser importance as a target than the main radar, but if you're actually shooting at these things, you probably know that already. Self-propelled gun and gun missile systems. While missiles promised to clear the skies of capitalist imperialism at longer ranges, early SAMs had large minimum ranges and were not especially mobile. To provide an umbrella of safety over the maneuver forces of peaceful fraternal socialist labor, the Soviets fell back on the reliable anti-aircraft gun now in self-propelled form. These systems are for incredibly short-range defense of point targets, forming the last line of protection against NATO aircraft. The first post-war Soviet self-propelled anti-aircraft gun was the uh, ZSU-57-2, sometimes called the Sparka. It entered service in 1955 and is armed with two 57mm S-68 cannons, which are functionally identical to the S-60 towed 57mm anti-aircraft gun, but not towed. Also, one of them feeds from the other side. These two guns were mounted in a large open-topped turret on a lightened, shortened T-54 tank chassis. Aiming and fire control is through an advanced optoelectronic sensor wired to a multi-purpose neural network for lead computation, target recognition, identification friend or foe, and other gun-related tasks. That is to say the Mark I eyeball and gray matter in the gunner's facial mount. The ZSU-57-2 is a fair-weather daytime system, unless the operators, I guess, managed to have some night vision goggles, but it was widely exported and has a quite lethal anti-armor capability against light vehicles. Never once to let a bad idea go to waste, the Czechoslovakians introduced the Praga M5359 ZSU PLDVK VZ5359, funnily enough, in 1959. The Praga is an armored 6x6 truck chassis with the twin 30mm VZ53 mounted en porte. Fire control is manual, as is train and elevation, while gun performance is the same as on the ground mount. The vehicle is armored against small arms and, mounting two powerful 30mm cannons, has a reasonable anti-armor capability, but is again a daytime fair weather system. The guns could be dismounted if you wished, though why you might do this is beyond my understanding. The Soviets weren't entirely satisfied by the performance of the ZSU-57-2 and embarked on a series of design studies as to what should replace it starting in 1957. Four vehicles were investigated, all named after rivers. The first was Dnieper. Dnieper? D-N-E-P-R? The one next to the Don. Um, which was an optical lead computing gun sight on the 57mm twin mount. Parallel to this was Volga, which would double the rate of fire of the 57mm guns and add a search and tracking radar. 
Due to production delays with the new Oka 57mm guns, both of these projects fizzled out by 1959. At the same time, the Soviets were developing two smaller caliber spags to complement each other, named Yenisei and Shilka. Yenisei, the ZSU-37-2 Grau Index 2A1, was developed by Uralmash Zavod and armed with twin 37mm 2A11 guns, a search and fire control radar, the 1RL-34, and is on a similar chassis to the SA-4 Ganef and 2S-3 152mm howitzer. Capable of engaging supersonic targets out to a slant range of 4,500 meters, the ZSU-37-2 passed state tests and was recommended for adoption, but the Soviets chose only to procure the Shilka. The Shilka, the last of the four developmental vehicles, or ZSU-23-4, also called Zeus to NATO, was the first Soviet integrated self propelled radar directed anti aircraft gun to see mass production. It entered service in 1965 and fitted the 2A10 cannon system, consisting of four 2A7 23mm water cooled auto cannon, alongside the 1A7 or RPK2 Tobol NATO gun dish fire control radar system mounting the 1RL-33 radar. It can engage to a slant range of 2,500 meters and can fire on the move or from the short halt in all weather conditions and visibilities. Shilka is best visually identified by the big square turret, the four guns on the front, the boxy hull, and the radar dish on top. Note that some were modified for ground support in Afghanistan, removing the radar and adding another 1,000 rounds of 23mm cannon. The typical deployment for the ZSU-23-4 was at the regimental level, consisting of an anti-aircraft gun missile battery of four ZSU-23-4 in two firing pairs and four SA-9 Gaskin short-range SAM launchers. We'll talk about those later. Circling back a little bit, the reason that the Soviets didn't produce both Shilka and Yenisei was because the Council of Ministers felt that Yanisei and Shilka did the same job and Shilka was slightly cheaper. Uh, Gun Dish is the distinctive radar carried by the ZSU-23-4 Shilka, also called the Zeus. It is a circular retractable antenna mounted on the turret rear. The BTRZD is an airborne self-propelled anti-aircraft vehicle. It was designed and produced by the Volgograd Tractor Factory and was adopted in 1984. Initially conceived as a modified BTRD airborne armored personnel carrier for manpads gunners, it relatively quickly was fitted with a ZU-23-2 23mm autocannon mount en porte. This was apparently done against the wishes of the manufacturers, but I certainly wouldn't want to tell a bunch of DeSantniki where they should or shouldn't put their anti-aircraft gun. While the BTRZD lacks fire control radar or protection for the gunners, it does have six man portable air defense systems or an anti aircraft gun, and being airborne and air mobile may be found in unusual and inconvenient places. Recognition features are the BTRD chassis and ZU 232 mount lashed to the roof. The BTRZD without ZU 232 mount is essentially indistinguishable from the standard model. The ZU 232 can also be mounted on a truck such as the Gaz 66. 4x4 or the Zill and Ural series 6x6, or on top of an armored vehicle like the MTLB. It has all of the anti-aircraft firepower of the ZU-232 with all the mobility of whatever vehicle it's based on, and is a very common modification. Improvised versions are often found in the Middle East. The 2F62, or Luaz with man pads, is one of a series of weapons carrier versions of the Luaz Lutsky Automobilny Zavod 967M amphibious 4x4 light truck. This one mounts a rack of man pads. The Luaz 967M was a neat little 4x4 runabout created to be a more versatile amphibious jeep type vehicle than earlier attempts at a Soviet amphibious jeep. Around 8,000 were produced and it was used in part by the VDV. The final spag on our list today is the 2S6M Tunguska, or SA-19 Gryson. You can also call it Tunguska. No one's going to be upset. Gryson is the successor to Shilka and has a far more capable radar system called Hot Shot by NATO. It entered service in 1982. It's armed with two 30mm 2A38 twin barrel cannons and eight missiles mounted in two blocks of four on either side of the turret. The guns can engage to an effective slant range of 4,000 meters, while the missiles are capable in short-range engagements especially against anti-tank helicopters. Gryson is a day-night and all-weather system. Tactically, SA-19 deployment tended to be either as two three-vehicle fire platoons at a regimental level, or as a one-for-one -one replacement of the ZSU-23-4 SA-9 combination alongside the SA-13, that is to say four SA-19 and four SA-13. Hot Shot is Gryson's radar system. It consists of a stowable rotating search radar on top of the vehicle and a forward-facing radar on the front of the turret. It is understood to be quite capable compared to contemporary systems.
After introducing static missile complexes and self-propelled anti-aircraft gun complexes, the Soviets sought to introduce mobile surface-to-air missiles to enable the air defense of maneuver forces, among other roles. These fall into three broad categories. Short-range systems are designed for area defense of subunits against air attack. Western equivalents would be like Shapral or Krotal. Medium-range systems are designed for area air defense of units and formations, equivalent to MIM-23 Hawk or similar. And long-range systems special in defending formations and higher formations from both aircraft and ballistic missiles, these would be equivalent to the Western Patriot or Nike Hercules missiles. SA-4 Ganef Development of the SA-4 Ganef, or 2K-11 Krug, meaning circle, began in the late 1950s with introduction in 1965. Ganef is a medium to long-range system which is semi-mobile and generally deployed at the Soviet Army level, equivalent to the NATO core level. Identification of the Ganef is by the two large ramjet-powered missiles on top of a launcher derived from the Su-100P, the same chassis family as the ZSU-37-2, 2S-3, and 2S-5. Ganef was mobile, but did not possess a shoot-on-the-move capability. Ganef was widely deployed in Soviet and closely Soviet-aligned forces, but never saw as much export success as its medium-range cousin, the SA-6 Gainful. However, Ganef did form the backbone of Soviet Army-level long-range air defense until it was replaced in the 1980s by the SA-12AB Gladiator Giant. Pat Hand is the fire control radar for Ganef. It is the same chassis as the launcher, with four circular antennas on top, which rotate and elevate to track the target. Long Track is a prolific Soviet early warning radar which takes the form of a rotating large curved oval shaped antenna with a big arm out front of it like a satellite dish. This is mounted on top of a tracked chassis with a truck cab. There is also a collapsible radio antenna at the front for communications. Long Track is very distinctive and will crop up fairly regularly so keep an eye out for its truck cab on a tank chassis aesthetic. SA-6 Gainful, Soviet name 2K-12 Kub or Cube, was the medium-range complementary Soviet air defense missile system to the long-range SA-4 Ganef. Development started in 1958 with introduction in 1967. Gainful is a medium-range surface-to-air missile system that mounts three missiles on a transporter erector launcher based on the same Michny machine building plant MMZ, or Metro Vagon Mash GM500 series chassis as the Zeus. The Gainful Tel is distinguished by the triple missile launcher that can train and elevate through 360 degrees of azimuth and 10 to 45 degrees of elevation. In travel position, the nose of the rockets point toward the rear of the vehicle. The gainful missile itself is a ramjet-powered, medium-range radar-guided SAM best identified by the four air intakes around the midsection of the missile and the small trapezoidal mid-body fins. The KUB missile complex also included a transporter loader, Transloader on the Zil 131 three and a half ton truck chassis that had three missiles and a crane for loading them onto launchers. The engagement radar for Gainful is straight flush, known to the Soviets as 1S91. It's a combined search and engagement radar system mounted on the same GM500 series chassis as the Gainful Tel. The top radar is for missile guidance, while the bottom radar dish is a search radar. These radars can operate independently of one another. Identification is by the stacked parabolic and circular radar dishes on a Zoo chassis. Typical deployment was one radar vehicle per Fortel battery. The SA-6B is the TLAR, or Transporter Erector Launcher Radar, version of the SA-6. It includes the Fire Dome radar and three gainful missiles, otherwise it's very similar to the SA-6A TEL. The SA-6 can also operate alongside the Flat Face Long Range Early Warning Radar, especially Flat Face B, and the Long Track Long Range Early Warning Radar. SA-6 is also typically found at the Division level. The other contemporary Soviet divisional level surface-to-air missile system was the SA-8 Gecko, known to the Soviets as 9K-33 OSA, or WASP. This was the initial widely deployed Soviet short-range radar-guided SAM system. Gecko comes in three main variants, but all three variants have a main rotating launcher and kind of boat-shaped amphibious truck hull with three evenly spaced axles. I don't know if OSA can fire the missiles while floating, but given the existence of a naval version, it could very well be able to do so. The initial missile complex introduced in 1971 was SA-8A. It is distinguished by the four missiles on the rails. The nominal range is 7,700 meters, and it is very common, but has since generally been supplanted by later models. In 1975, Gecko was modernized to SA-8B Gecko Mod Zero standard. This switched to six containerized missiles, and the performance of the radar and missiles were upgraded across the board. SA-8B Gecko Mod One 
or 9K33 M2 OSA AKM, was the 1980 modernization of SA-8B Gecko Mod 0, which has internal radar upgrades and an IFF system. Missile nominal range has been upgraded to between 10 and 15 kilometers, and estimates vary. The radar search and fire control system on SA-8 is known as Land Roll. Land Roll can search and track on the move and fire from a short halt, and is designed to engage low-flying aircraft and some helicopters at short ranges to provide short-range area air defense to maneuver units. Land Roll is visually distinguished by the big central radar with two smaller flat antennas next to it and the big search dish on top. The search dish spins independently of the rest of it. SA-8 can also integrate with flat face and long track. The SA-9 Gaskin, or 9K-31 Strela Adin, Aero-1, is the first Soviet regimental-level surface-to-air missile system. Introduced in 1968, it is a fire-and-forget missile with an unusual seeker design that means it had a passable front aspect capability at a time when most similar missiles, such as the Western Chapral, were rear aspect only. Early heat-seeking missiles like the American AIM-9 Sidewinder or Soviet AA-2 Atoll were only able to lock on to the hot jet pipe or exhaust of an airplane. Since, therefore, they could only lock on from the rear, they're called rear aspect. You can see this in the thermal camera footage of these fighter jets that the exhaust is a lot hotter than the rest of the plane. The SA-9 gets around this by using an ultraviolet photocontrast seeker that gives impressive, for the time, all aspect capability. The missile has a nominal range of about 3 kilometers, and being passive seeking, the only launch warning a pilot would get is the visual of the missile launch. The Gaskin launch vehicles produced after 1970 also had a passive radar, or a radar warning receiver, enhancing the engagement of aircraft who have radars or radios turned on. Visual identification of Gaskin is relatively straightforward. It is a BRDM-2 with the turret replaced by an anti-aircraft missile installation consisting of four square transport and launch tubes that extend up for combat and attract relatively flat against the roof for movement. It is still amphibious and like all BRDM-2 variants, basically unarmored. Dog Ear is a search and early warning radar for short-range air defense use mounted on the MTLBU chassis. It features a roughly square-shaped curved antenna which can fold, and when in use the dish rotates. SA-10 Grumble SA-10 started as the replacement for earlier generations of static strategic SAM system for the PVO, but was later expanded to be a mobile long-range system for ground forces, air defense, and other forces. The initial SA-10A Grumble was introduced in 1978-79 to and was a semi-static trailer mobile system with a nominal range of 47 kilometers, later doubled by a new missile. SA-10B and SA-10C were incremental improvements to the system, new missiles, while SA-10D was the first fully mobile system where every element was self-propelled rather than trailered. SA-10D entered service about 1982 to 1985 and has since been very widely deployed. SA-10 replaces SA-1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in Soviet service. The trailer variants are known to the Russians as S-300 PT and derivatives, while the self-mobile ones that are more commonly seen are S-300 PS or PM. The SA-10 series is very distinctive, with the four missiles in cylindrical launch containers in a trapezoidal arrangement on a trailer or transporter erector launcher view. Vehicle. Telling the variants of SA-10 family apart is a mess of looking for relatively minor details like trailer or what exact chassis the missile or radar is mounted on, and the SA-10 series all serve the same purpose. As such, telling them apart isn't exactly the most pressing issue. However, telling it apart from other Soviet SAM systems is useful. Flap lid A, B, and C are the fire control radars for the SA-10 Grumble series SAM. The initial variant was flap lid A mounted on a trailer. However, growing U.S. suppression of enemy air defenses and electronic warfare advances pushed the Soviets to pursue and field a more mobile system, the SA-10B, with the accompanying flap lid B truck-mounted radar. The flap lid series take the form of a big squarish radar antenna at a 45-degree angle. It can also be mounted on either of two masts, one of 24 meters or 80 feet, and one of 40 meters or 130 feet. Tin Shield is the initial acquisition and search radar for the SA-10 series, later supplemented by other models. Tin Shield is a large rectangular, slightly curved antenna with a full-length bar feed horn on a stick in front of it. It is a very long-range radar and comes on either a trailer or a mast. Clam Shell is an exclusively mast-mounted radar for the SA-10 family. It is a specific low-level search and acquisition radar for the SA-10 series missiles. It has since been supplanted in Russian service, but it is a common Soviet system. SA-11 Gadfly, or the 9K-37 Buk, meaning beach like the tree, is an upgrade and replacement for the SA-6 Gainful. 
It features improved missiles, a transporter, erector, launcher, and radar, or TLAR. The biggest change from Gainful to Gadfly is the switch from ramjet engines on Gainful to the dual-mode rocket motor on Gadfly, mainly to solve issues with intake airflow when the rocket turns and high drag from the inlets after burnout. SA-11 Gadfly can be visually identified by the four launch rails, while the missile is best identified by the lack of ramjet intakes and long mid-body streaks. The fire control radar, mounted on the front of the SA-11 Gadfly TLAR, is Fire Dome. This was previously used on the SA-6 Gainful TLAR, but this is an upgraded version with four of the new Gadfly missiles. It eventually has been replaced in production and service by Chair Back, the electronically scanned array flat panel radar. The original, less common search radar for SA-11 Gadfly is Tube Arm. It's mounted on the same GM series chassis as the missile TLAR, and is a large, slightly curved dish antenna with a feed horn mounted on a bar in front. It spins in use and folds flat for movement. Snow Drift is the replacement for Tube Arm after Tube Arm was found inadequate. It is on the same chassis and is visually identified by the large rectangular panel at a slight angle with an articulated panel above it and a large retractable antenna mast at the front. The tracked corollary to the trailer or wheel-mounted S300P series is the S300V series, known to NATO as the SA-12. SA-12 was initially developed as principally an anti-ballistic missile system for the air defense forces of the ground forces in light of the large numbers of NATO tactical and operational range ballistic missiles such as Lance and Pershing, of which the Soviets estimated just under 700 would be available to NATO forces in Europe. This program started in the early 1960s with the prototype passing state tests in 1981 and adoption in 1983. NATO quickly queued into one of the key distinguishing features of the system, the two types of missile carried. The smaller is 9M83. This is known to NATO as SA-12A Gladiator. It's designed for shorter range ballistic missiles and has a secondary anti-aircraft capability, while the larger 9M82 or SA-12B Giant was optimized for operational tactical ballistic missiles such as Pershing, as well as air-launched ballistic missiles like SRAM. There's a good way to tell them apart. Gladiator has four missiles, and the launcher-mounted radar goes up on a big stick, while Giant has two missiles, and the radar is mounted on a long horizontal arm over the front cabin. There is also a transloader launcher, which has no radar, with a variant for each missile type. The missiles are not interchangeable with SA-10. Both are hilariously long-ranged, but only if fired at targets that can't maneuver particularly well and have good capability against contemporary ballistic missiles. All the vehicles of the SA-12 family share a chassis based on the 2S7 Pion 203mm artillery piece, and as a result have quite good off-road mobility for a frontal-level SAM system. The engagement radar for SA-12AB Gladiator Giant is Grill Pan. Grill Pan shares a chassis with Giant Gladiator Tell and TLARs, and is best visually identified by the big octagonal radar dish with rectangular antenna arrays on the top and three central thingamajigs on the bottom. I'm not a radar expert, so please don't ask me what they are. Grill Pan does also have a big mast and the radar spins to point at the target it wants to kill. The acquisition radar for SA-12 series SAMs is billboard. Like the other vehicles, it uses the common chassis, but with a very large rectangular radar array on top that folds for storage. The radar rotates and folds from stowed and rotates to scan through 360 degrees. Next, there is the command and control vehicle, which just looks like a really comfy mobile home on the same chassis. Like, if you took out the missile consoles and everything inside of it, it looks like it'd be pretty fun to like go camping in because it's a tank chassis that can go anywhere and you could have like a nice little studio apartment in the back. That might just be me. Finally, there is High Screen, a sector search anti-ballistic missile early warning radar on the same common chassis. It is distinguished by the elongated octagonal shape of the antenna array and that it spins when searching. It also folds flat for storage. Shifting gears quite radically from that digression, we have the SA-13 Gopher, or 9K35 Strela-10, a direct replacement and upgrade for the SA-9 Gaskin. It was developed alongside the Tunguska program to replace the ZSU-23-4 Shilka. The work started in 1969 and continued until adoption in 1976. It's very widely proliferated. It featured new missiles, a more stable chassis, swapping the BRDM-2 for an MTLB, and could carry four reloads in the hull for the missiles 
skills on top. It also has broadly increased tactical technical characteristics across the board. The new missile has increased countermeasure resistance and range, as well as the snapshot ranging radar. The system was also more robustly integrated into the networked air defense system. Snapshot is the millimeter band radar mounted on SA-13 Gopher. It is used to work out an optimum super elevation and lead for the mount to ensure the missile is within acceptable launch parameters. Like its predecessor, the SA-13 Gopher can be linked with the dog ear radar for early warning. Work began on the replacement for SA-8 Gecko, SA-15 Gauntlet, or 9K-330 Tor, meaning Thor, in 1975, and the replacement was adopted in 1986. It is a radical departure from the formula of SA-8, moving from a wheeled mount with angled launchers to a tracked vertical launch system. The target was also changed, with more challenging threats like cruise missiles, necessitating a more accurate missile with a lower minimum engagement height as well as more missiles. Gauntlet mounts eight vertically launched missiles in a rotation turret with a large square radar on the front and a spinning search radar on the back that can fold for storage. It shares a chassis with the SA-19 Gryson. While Gauntlet can operate alone, it is best used as part of a networked IADS, where early warning radars and higher echelon SAM systems can work together for greater situational awareness. Gauntlet is very visually distinctive, looking something like a brick with tracks and a spinning radar. Since the base model, upgrades have been produced to further increase the networked nature of Soviet and then Russian air defense systems, as well as missile and radar performance. When used on its own, it typically shoots down airliners, but if you use it as part of a robust network, it is very effective. Scrum Half is the name for the whole engagement radar complex on SA-15, consisting of the tracking and engagement radar on the front and the retractable spinning search radar on top. This rounds out the Soviet air defense missile complexes that we are going to discuss today. I could push it further into the post-Cold War era, but this is a guide to the Cold War Soviet Army, and I really don't feel like doing that. The final category we're going to discuss today are Man Portable Air Defense Systems, or MAN Pads. While the FIM-43 Red Eye, a product of the San Diego, California-based Convair Division of the General Dynamics Corporation, was the first man-portable air defense system, man pads, the Soviets actively sought the capability as soon as they heard about the concept. They would go on to introduce a series of excellent man pads, which were widely exported throughout the world. The first was SA-7 Grail. It was introduced in 1968, and is roughly equivalent to the American Convair General Dynamics FIM-43 Red Eye. SA-7 was produced in very large numbers and widely proliferated, but is rear aspect only, which means you can only hit an attacking plane after it bombed you, but it was pretty dangerous to unsuspecting planes and absolutely murderous to helicopters. It is a very short-range fire-and-forget missile. SA-7 Grail is known to the Soviets as 9K-32 Strela-2, meaning Arrow 2. This is a product of the Strela program, which we've heard about the other uh, parts of, that also produced the SA-9 Gaskin, 9K31 Strela-1, SA-13 Gopher, 9K35 Strela-10, and the next missile, the SA-14 Gremlin, or 9K34 Strela-3. This was a improvement package developed for the SA-7 Grail in 1974. Like Grail, it was produced in large numbers and widely distributed within Soviet and Warsaw Pact forces, as well as Soviet-supplied nations around the world. It introduced a new and more countermeasure-resistant seeker, though the SA-7 Grail seeker was frankly kind of countermeasure-enthusiastic. It also had a cooled seeker, which made it more sensitive and therefore easier to lock onto targets, including a limited ability to lock targets pointing toward the shooter. This is known as an all aspect capability, because you can target a plane from all aspects, front, back, sides, whatever. The next man pads the Soviets developed was the SA-16 Gimlet, or 9K310 Igla-1, a simplified interim model of man pads to account for delays in fielding the successor to SA-14. Work on the Igla, meaning needle, program began in the early 70s as a whole new replacement for the existing man pads, but development of the new Seeker caused a lot of issues, so the Soviets put an improved SA-14 a 14 seeker on the new higher performance missile, resulting in SA-16 Gimlet. Gimlet entered service in 1981 and was widely proliferated, something of a theme for man pads. It features improved lethality, range maneuverability, and an IFF system. The culmination of the previously mentioned IGLA program is SA-18 Grouse, or 9K38 IGLA. It entered service in 1983, bringing increased seeker sensitivity and therefore all-around combat performance, especially against non-cooperative targets. Later, 
post-Soviet systems have improved on it, but it's a man pads. It'll hit you if you're low and slow, but to be able to fire it from the shoulder of the missile, it really don't have much get up and go. It's great for blasting A-10s out of the sky, though. That's your poetry quota for the entire series. I hope you enjoyed that. This wraps up our discussion of Soviet and Warsaw Pact anti-aircraft systems. There will be a quick overview at the end of the guide to help with visual recognition, especially of the missiles, but right now let's shift gears into anti-tank weapons. Anti-tank weapons are kind of a no-brainer, right? There's that old axiom axiom that a force without sufficient anti-tank weapons is either in retreat or about to be, and while it's an axiom so it lacks nuance, tanks provide an excellent combination of mobility, firepower, and protection on the battlefield, so being able to knock them out is a desirable capability. During the Cold War, the Soviets produced a large variety of Protivotankovia Ruzhia, or anti-tank weapons. Some of them have been discussed in part or whole in the previous episode discussing protected mobility, and I would suggest taking a look at that as well. To make the capability of these anti-tank weapons easier to keep track of, I'm going to describe their performance by comparing them to the NATO tanks they'd be tasked with defeating. I'm going to be painting with broad strokes here, but this is a spotting guide, not a field manual. The first category of NATO armor is the worst protected. It is comprised of post-war medium tanks and some early main battle tanks. The typical examples are the M46 and 47, the Centurion, the Leopard 1, and Amex 30. I'm going to call these NATO's tinfoil tanks. The second group are NATO's bloat tanks, the M103 Conqueror, Chieftain M48, and M60. They're big, they have lots of simple steel armor that is very effective against full-bore armor-piercing shells, but bad against darts and heat shells. The final group is NATO's box tanks that are very well armored with advanced and well-balanced kinetic and shape charge protection. These are Abrams, Leopardu, Challenger, and Friends. So first we've got anti-tank missiles. Anti-tank missiles are kind of large and cumbersome, and mounting them to a vehicle makes life a bit easier for all parties involved. This is especially true for earlier or larger missiles, or on the theoretical Cold War battlefield where the Soviets have gone for tea and biscuits on the Rhine, and everything between Dunkirk and Dnipropetrovsk is on fire or liberally doused with nerve gas. The first Soviet anti-tank missile vehicle was the 2P-26, or Gaz-69 AT-1 Snapper. The Soviet name for the missile was Schmel, meaning bumblebee, and the the system entered service in 1960 both on the Gaz-69 as the 2K-15 complex with 2P-26 vehicle and on the BRDM-1 as the 2K-16 complex with 2P-27 vehicle. The Gaz Snapper has four missiles ready to fire and the missiles have manual command line of sight control with wire guidance. With a crew of two, the vehicle could sustain around two engagements per minute but the rear mounting of the missiles and large silhouette, combined with the lack of any armor at all, makes the vehicle somewhat vulnerable. Snapper can knock out NATO's tinfoil tanks and is competitive against the NATO bloat tanks, but is basically useless against the NATO box tanks. The range is up to 2,000 meters, with a flight speed of about 100 meters per second and a roughly 400 meter dead zone. The BTR-40 AT-3 Sager is an East German ATGM carrier variant of the BTR-40 with, it looks like, four missiles on a mount similar to that of the Soviet BRDM-1 Sager launcher. As mentioned in the Protected Mobility video, Sager or Malyutka entered service in 1963 with a dead zone of 500 meters, a range of 3,000 meters, and a flight speed of about 115 meters a second. It can handily kill NATO tinfoil and bloat tanks, but it is of very limited utility against box tanks. It is also a manual command line of sight so hard to steer, but a very small and efficient manual command line of sight missile. Click in the corner here for more on that. Snapper was also integrated onto the BRDM-1 in an elevating three-rail launcher with three reloads carried aboard. The missiles point forwards this time, but the other tactical technical characteristics of the missile system are similar to the truck-mounted version. It can swim though just like the BRDM-1. Parallel to AT-1 Snapper, the Soviets also developed AT-2 Swatter, or 3M-11 Falanga, Phalanx. This missile was still manual command line of sight, but crucially used a radio link to send the guidance signal to the missile, so it had a longer range and could be used by aircraft. Introduced in 1960, BRDM-1 AT-2 Swatter, or 2P-32, to the Soviets had a max range of 2,500 meters and a minimum range of 500 meters with 160 meter per second flight speed. The initial 3M-11 had serious teething problems and the 9M17 AT2 Swatter B was introduced in 1968 with range increased to 3,500 meters and a better warhead alongside improved reliability. In 1961, the Soviets began development of a new ATGM, which would be both vehicle-mounted and man-packed. Uh, more on that later. It entered service in 1963, and NATO called it AT3 Sager, while to the Soviets the missile was Malyutka, meaning baby. The vehicle mount on a BRDM-1 chassis was Ovod, meaning gadfly. I won't rehash the performance 
variants of the AT3 Sager or the BRDM1 here, but remember that the AT3 Sager on BRDM1 chassis has the same performance as a Sager and a BRDM1 just stuck together. The BRDM2 AT3 Sager or 9P122 is a BRDM2 with six AT3 Sager rails on a retractable mount. The mount retracts flush with the roof and takes 20 seconds to deploy or undeploy. The missile is manual command line of sight, but there is a Seiklos version that has a rounded sight thing at the front instead of a flattened one. This is a pretty nitpicky detail and the Seiklos and Mclose Sager are of relatively simple and uh, comparable performance to each other, uh, but it is something to keep in mind if you do see it. BRDM2 was also produced with AT2 Swatter. It's broadly the same in its performance of the weapon system as BRDM1 AT2 Swatter, except it's on the more mobile BRDM2 chassis. The Seiklos Swatter variant was also produced, and it has the same frontal hull difference between the Seiklos and Mclos Sager BRDM2s, just with a different missile. These all are kind of much of a muchness. I don't blame you if you have a hard time telling them apart. It's kind of a pain in the ass to even try and find pictures to tell them apart. Perhaps the most iconic ATGM BRDM variant, though, is the BRDM2 AT45 Spigot Spandrel, Grau Index 9P148. This is a wholly ground-up built vehicle. It features a retractable 5-rail launcher for the AT4 Spandrel or AT5 Spigot with 15 total missiles carried. It was introduced in 1974 and remains in service around the world. The main identifying feature of the BRDM2 AT45 is the 5-rail launcher on top, or if that's retracted, the small sight box on the roof of the vehicle and having two front windows unlike the earlier ATGM BRDMs that only have a driver's window. This vehicle is ubiquitous, identifiable, and like all of the BRDM variants, armored like paper. Moving swiftly forwards, we arrive at the IT-1 Drakon. The IT-1 is a very niche Soviet missile arm tank destroyer that has a unique ATGM system and saw service in, from the late 1960s through the early 1970s in very small numbers. 220 examples were produced, which is among the fewest of any vehicle I'm willing to discuss in this series. NATO literally never knew this existed, and it was only deployed in somewhere around seven independent tank destroyer battalions of 24 to 28 vehicles, each in the Belarusian and Transcarpathian military districts. By the early 1970s, a combination of persistent technical issues with the missile system and the upcoming five-year maintenance cycle meant that the vehicles were withdrawn from service and converted to driver mechanic training vehicles or other utility uses. Suffice it to say that the only reason I'm talking about this thing is because of its popularization thanks to certain games which we are not going to talk about. Tacking back to more relevant systems, we have the MTLB AT6 Spiral or AT9 Spiral 2. Developed in the 1970s and entering service in 1979, the MTLB AT6 Spiral or 9P149 Sturm S uses the AT6 Spiral or 9M114 missile on an MTLB chassis. Inside the chassis is a fancy revolving autoloader system holding 12 anti tank missiles. The rockets themselves are very fast, able to defeat tinfoil and bloat tanks, and they can defeat some box tanks at ranges out to 5 kilometers, with 1980s modifications extending the range and anti-armor performance to 6 or 7 kilometers and defeating the box tanks as well. In the early 1990s, the AT-6 Spiral received a generational upgrade, the AT-9 Spiral 2 or 9M120 Ataka attack. It is generally an across-the-board improvement to the missile system, and it featured an improved tandem warhead able to defeat all of the NATO box tanks, as well as a thermobaric and proximity-fused missile. It used the same launchers and is generally similar in most respects. The MTLB with Spiral Series anti-tank missiles is quite a potent anti-tank weapon system. It is also relatively discreet as these things go. The retractable anti-tank missile launcher means that it's relatively hard to pick out. The missile launch vehicle, with it retracted, saves for the sight unit on the starboard side of the vehicle. While the sight unit is distinctive, at a distance or in poor weather, it could easily be mistaken for something else, like the various machine gun mountings the MTLB can have in that position. The vehicles, though, do retain the MTLB's excellent off-road maneuverability and amphibious capability. We haven't talked about the SPG-9 itself, that'll be in a few minutes, but the SPG-9 was mounted on the UAZ-469 and the Luaz-967. It's basically a giant Carl Gustav that fires the same ammo as a BMP-1's gun, and the UAZ and Luaz also could carry the AT-4 Spigot or AT-5 Spandrel or AT-7 Saxhorn, depending on what schematic you can find. It's kind of weird, like the UAZ is almost ubiquitous, but you can find a lot more pictures of Luaz's with anti-tank missiles on them than 
UACs. Uh, the BTR-RD is another one of those pretty straightforward anti-tank missile vehicles. It's a BTRD armored personnel carrier with an AT-45 Spigot Spantral launcher on a pintle mounted to the roof. The vehicle carries spare missiles, but the gunner does have to expose the top half of their body to use the firing post. Save for the vehicle moving the firing post around and the angry DeSantnik operating it, the BTRD is just your bog standard AT-45 Spigot Spantral launcher, so refer back to the information given previously. It does retain, however, the BTRD's ability to be airdropped and to swim. Not satisfied with the Legacy Sturm S MTLB AT-6 or 9 anti-tank vehicle, the Soviets began cooking up a successor in the 1980s with Kolomna taking the lead using the BMP-3 chassis. The AT-15 Springer on BMP-3 has a ton of high technology features such as a millimeter band radar, the automated loading of missiles into the vehicle, and two missiles on the launcher at any one time, and it can be fired at different angles through two different guidance channels. With 15 total missiles carried, the missiles are are quite deadly and should be expected to easily defeat NATO's tinfoil bloat and box tanks, uh, but given that this vehicle entered service in 2004, that really shouldn't be surprising that it can defeat Cold War era tanks. This is somewhat outside of the timescale of our discussion here, but I wanted to include it just to round everything out. Having dealt with Soviet anti-tank missile vehicles, let's segue into Soviet anti-tank missile firing posts and handheld anti-tank weapons. Sometimes, in the course of combat actions, a Soviet infantryman defending the peaceful forces of socialist labor from the hordes of bellicose Western imperialism might find himself confronted by a devilish capitalist tank without any vehicles nearby to help him. For these circumstances, the ever-clever Soviet engineers and design bureaus developed man-portable anti-tank missile systems and grenade launchers. The first of these is the AT-3 Sager, or the Melyutka. I already talked about Sager, so for missile performance, just go look at that bits where I explained it already. Neither of us wants me to say the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. That said, the Sager Melyutka system has a nifty little man-portable complex, nicknamed Suitcase Sager. The likely apocryphal story is that when the Israelis saw the Egyptians running around with the missile containers, they joked that they were businessmen going to work with suitcases, ha ha ha. Well, after Sager went to work in the Sinai, it was wasn't the Israelis who were laughing anymore. Note that each guidance controller has a number of missiles with it. Like most manual command line of sight ATGMs, the launcher can be some distance away from the operator, perhaps up to 50 or 80 meters. This can make suppressing these early anti-tank missiles kind of hard, but they're also absolutely garbage at hitting anything without insane levels of practice, so it's a mixed bag. The replacement for Sager was AT4 Spigot AT5 Spandrel. I'm really going to have to suggest watching my previous segment discussing Spigot Spandrel for the tactical technical characteristics of the missiles. Spigot was introduced in 1970, Spantrel was introduced in 74, and the visual identification of these firing posts is best done through the low tripod with offset square sight to the port side of the launcher. Spigot Spantrel is a very common anti-tank missile and is quite powerful against NATO's tinfoil and bloat tanks with marginal capability against some early box tanks. A tandem warhead version that can defeat the box tanks kind of exists for AT-5 Spantrel but really hasn't been seen much in service. Thermal add-ons for the launcher do exist, but they're kind of janky and not seen often. The early thermal clip-on sights can be identified by the same cooling bottles plugged into the back that you see plugged into the cooling systems for Soviet man pads. The AT-7 Saxhorn, or 9K-115 Metis, meaning Meti, was adopted in 1979 as a battalion-level anti-tank missile. It's relatively light, around 10 kilos for the launcher and 6.3 kilos for the rocket in the transport launch tube. It has a range of 1,000 meters and can reliably defeat NATO tinfoil and bloat tanks, but would struggle against box tanks. Developed through the 1980s and introduced into service in 92, AT-13 Saxhorn II, or 9K-115-1 Metis M, adds 500 meter range and a tandem warhead. This should allow reliable defeat of all three categories of Cold War NATO tank, but it's post-Cold War, so who the <coughs> knows? The last dismounted anti-tank missile launcher we'll talk about today is the AT-14 Spriggan, better known as 9K-135 Cornet, or Coronet, the, the brass instrument, like a trumpet, but the Anyway, it's a complex with the 9M133 missile. It was the generational replacement for the AT-45 Spigot Spandrel, and it's a hilariously powerful missile, able to knock out damn near any modern tank. 
So that wraps up the anti-tank missiles, but what if the intrepid Soviet infantryman finds himself without the wonders of Soviet missile and rocket technology? Well, then he would have to rely on Soviet RPGs, uh, Rushnoi Protivo Tankovoy Granata Myot, a handheld anti-tank grenade launcher. The first of these was the RPG-2. It's very old, entering service in 1949, but very widely exported. It can defeat the armor of the tinfoil tanks, but would struggle against basically anything else. It saw extensive use in Southeast Asia, and its identification is best done by the straight-walled tube and single pistol grip. The replacement for the RPG-2 was the ubiquitous RPG-7, which almost needs no introduction. It was, however, introduced in 1961 and remains in widespread service. A huge number of grenades were made for it, from the original anti-tank one to high-explosive and thermobaric, as well as the typical steady increase in penetration performance to the anti-tank grenades. With the standard grenades, it can reliably defeat tinfoil and bloat tanks from the front and sides of close range, while the tandem warhead from the late 1980s would defeat the armor of contemporary box tanks, but it has miserable range and has been the reference threat for modern western tank designers since the late 1980s. A version for paratroopers was also made the RPG-7D that can split in half. Identification of the RPG-7 is best done through the two pistol grips and the big cone at the back. It can be equipped with a number of optical, night, and thermal sights. The VDV weren't entirely satisfied with the RPG-7D, so the Soviets developed the rpg 6 just for them. They really should feel special. It's visually kind of similar to the RPG-7, but it only has one pistol grip and it does have a bipod. The caliber of the launch tube is also a bit larger, but it's not the easiest thing to see. RPG-16 is longer ranged and more accurate than RPG-7 due to a higher projectile velocity, but it only has enough penetration to deal with the tinfoil and the bloat tanks, and unlike the RPG-7, the warhead is in the tube, so you can't just make a bigger warhead on the front. The, the thing about diameter is that uh, high explosive any tank charges that these use the uh, penetration power scales with how wide it is so if you have the missile sticking out the or the the warhead sticking out the front of the launch tube like RPG-7 you can just keep putting wider warheads on it whereas if it's in the tube you're only able to do it as wide as the tube RPG-18 is the next one we're going to discuss and it's basically a Soviet version of the M72 law in concept that replaced hand thrown anti tank grenades in Soviet service it has a nominal effective range of like 150 meters which is you know better than throwing an anti tank grenade but not great. It can frontally penetrate the tinfoil and bloat tanks and is effective against the side armor of box tanks. They literally made like a million and a half of these things, so they're super common and basically performance-wise identical to the M72 Law series. RPG-22 is a more powerful derivative of the RPG-18 and it's basically the same except it doesn't extend as much and is a bit wider in diameter. It can defeat the tinfoil and bloat tanks from all around, but can really only defeat the box tanks from the side. The RPG-26 is an improved successor to the RPG-22 that was supposed to be more accurate, powerful, and user-friendly, but it really isn't meaningfully more powerful or anything else. It still can't kill the box tanks. The penultimate RPG we'll talk about today is RPG-27. Think of it basically as an RPG-26 scaled up to fit that big-ass tandem charge warhead from the RPG-7. The anti-armor performance is the same as the RPG-7 tandem, and it probably would just mulch your brain with the shockwave. Finally, we have the RPG-29, which is basically the RPG-16D concept, scaled up to shoot the big tandem warhead from the RPG-7. It's an absolutely massive weapon that isn't in service because it was found to be too heavy for practical combat use in its 1990 troop trials. That rounds out our discussion of anti-tank missile firing posts and anti-tank grenade launchers today. So let's shift quickly into towed and self-propelled gun systems. The Soviets used towed and self-propelled anti-tank guns, both conventional and recoilless, throughout the entirety of the Cold War. These weapons are here defined as crew-served direct-fire artillery pieces deployed or designed especially for use as anti-tank weapons. A quick terminology note, these weapons fall into two broad categories, conventional guns and recoilless guns. Conventional guns are standard closed breech weapons, the typical cannon, while recoilless guns have an open breech and eject a countermass to offset the recoil of firing in exchange for a large firing signature, think like a Carl Gustav or an M106, M40, 106mm. I always get that one wrong. Also note, when I'm talking about the gun shield, uh, a winged gun shield is one where the left and right edges of the shield angle backwards from the perpendicular axis of the gun barrel to form a pair of wings. These can be quite small like on the 17 pounder or very aggressive like the one on the pack 40 or the 6 pounder. The square or flat gun shields 
are those where the plate of the gun shield is just a flat plate, like on the Zis 2, Zis 3, or 37mm M3. Self-propelled guns are those on a dedicated vehicle chassis, be it casemate or turreted, while self-moving mounts are modified towed carriages that have small motors to enhance battlefield mobility. Because this is a spotting guide, I'm not going to be detailing the exact types and performance of ammunition for these weapons, but a number of them can be found in the excellent Tankograd article on towed anti-tank guns. First, we have the recoilless guns. The Soviets had a interest in recoilless artillery going back to before World War II. While this did get out somewhat out of hand in the post-war era, note the S-103 420mm recoilless nuclear cannon, they did produce a great number of relatively sensible recoilless anti-tank guns. The immediate post-World War II Soviet recoilless anti-tank gun adopted in 1950 was the SPG-82. It was effective against the targets it faced in Korea, but really only kind of effective against the tinfoil tanks. It was also heavy, 32 kilos, and short range, 200 meters. It's quite recognizable by the wheeled mount and big gun shield. The improved version of it is the 82mm B10. This has a doubled range, 400 meters, and a somewhat improved warhead that brings marginal performance against NATO's bloat tanks, but at the cost of weighing over 85 kilos. It was introduced in 1954, but was out of service by the mid-60s. Introduced alongside the B10 was the B11, an even bigger recoilless rifle that was handily able to defeat all but the toughest of NATO's bloat tanks at the cost of weighing over 300 kilos. It has an effective range of 450 meters and is honestly better conceptualized as a light anti-tank gun than like a shoulder-fired, uh, you know, recoilless launcher. It was replaced, however, by the 73mm SPG-9 recoilless gun. The B-10 and B-11 were replaced in service by the 73mm recoilless SPG-9. This fires the same projectiles as the BMP-1 with a different propellant, so the penetration is the same as the BMP-1's Grom cannon. This means that it can reliably defeat the tinfoil and the bloat tanks, but it'll have big trouble with the front-of-box tanks. It was introduced in 1963 and has been widely proliferated. It also has an effective combat range of something like 600 meters against moving targets. Again, think of it as the gun off a BMP-1, but on a tripod. It is also recoilless, so beware of the big backblast, uh, and there was an airborne variant made, the SPG-9D. Then we have the 82mm recoilless VZ-59, a Czechoslovakian recoilless towed anti-tank gun from the late 1950s. The typical tractor was the Gaz-69 Jeep, and it was also carried by the OT-810 and OT-62 Topash en porte. It has a 12.7mm, or caliber 50, spotting rifle, and can defeat native those tinfoil tanks quite well, but would be of middling effect against the bloat tanks and completely useless against the box tanks. The gun has a quite powerful backblast and a range of around 1200 meters. Finally, the Taras Nietzsche 21 or T21 is an 82mm smoothbore recoilless gun that I mentioned in passing in the protected mobility episode as the Czechoslovakians like to bolt it to vehicles to beef up their anti-tank capabilities. It has no spotting rifle, uh, but it does have a range around 300 meters against moving and 600 meters against static targets, and was introduced in 1951. Anti-armor performance is similar to the previously mentioned Czechoslovakian anti-tank launcher, the VZ-59, able to knock out tinfoil tanks, middling against bloat tanks, and suicide against box tanks. With the recoilless guns out of the way, let's get into the fun stuff, the conventional cannons. Towed anti-tank guns were found throughout Soviet organizations during the entire Cold War period, typically in the anti-tank battalion of Soviet motor rifle regiments or divisions, or the anti-tank regiment of armies and perhaps frontal anti-tank brigades, though fronts were inherently task-organized without a permanent peacetime structure. They would be found defending likely avenues of approach from well-camouflaged and dug-in positions, complemented by anti-tank missile firing posts or carriers. The idea of a complement gun missile anti-tank defense was not inherently unsound, however the size and immobility of towed anti-tank guns compared to ATGM firing posts became a hindrance as the 70s progressed and tank fire control systems and observation systems introduced shoot on the move and thermal imaging systems. That said, towed anti-tank guns persisted in the Soviet organization through the end of the Cold War. In the immediate post-war era, the Soviet military briefly flirted with the idea of self-moving guns. The SD-57 was the result of this program. It is a 57mm towed anti-tank gun on a self-moving mount. The SD-57 is derived from the CH-26 towed anti-tank gun and shares the 74 caliber barrel, but with a redesigned muzzle brake. The CH-26 had a long, many-ported brake like the early ASU-57s, while the SD-57 has the more traditional two-port brake. Under 
200 examples each of the normal and self-moving mounts were made, and the SD57 mainly saw service with the VDV. It was superseded by the SD44. The gun effectiveness is on par with the 57mm gun on the ASU-57. The 85mm divisional gun D44, GAU index, G-A-U, not G-R-A-U, uh, the earlier system, 52P367, entered service in 1946 and was produced until 1954. It saw wide service in the Soviet Army as well as those of Soviet-aligned countries. Just under 11,000 guns were manufactured and the D-44 saw active combat use with the OKSVA, the limited contingent of Soviet forces in Afghanistan, as well as numerous local and regional conflicts. It was also produced in Communist China as the Type 56, not to be confused with the various other things called Type 56 by the Chinese. The D-44 was deployed throughout Soviet motor rifle units in the 1940s and 50s before being phased out as the primary anti-tank gun by more modern guns in the late 1950s and 60s, remaining as an indirect fire and training piece in various Soviet units through the end of the Cold War. When in service, the D-44 was found in the Divisional Artillery Regiment, DAR, uh, DAR, of Motor Rifle Division, specifically the two tube gun battalions of the DAR, as well as the anti-tank battalion of the Motor Rifle Regiment and Tank Regiment. The D-44 was able to effectively defeat wartime and immediate post-war medium and heavy tanks at combat ranges such as Sherman, Cromwell, Comet, and Pershing. The introduction of modern post-war vehicles such as Centurion Conqueror M47, M48, and M103 meant that conventional 85mm armor-piercing rounds were no longer viable. A low-velocity heat FS round was introduced in the 1950s, able to readily penetrate post-war mediums such as Centurion M47 and M48, but with only moderate performance against post-war heavy tanks. The low velocity translated to a low effective range roughly equivalent to contemporary recoil systems like BAT and M40. However, by the early 1960s, a higher-velocity heat FS round was introduced, which had slightly worse anti-armor performance than the previous one, but had double the muzzle velocity and over triple the point-blank range, meaning that it was adequate against the most common threats, but was able to hit said threats far more easily. The 85mm divisional gun D44 is best identified by the two-chamber muzzle brake, as many of these towed anti-tank guns look quite similar. Produced from 1954 to 57, and in relatively small numbers, only 819 guns, the 85mm divisional gun D48 and D48N is an 85mm towed anti-tank gun developed as an analog to the PAC-43. Of these 819, only 100 were produced as a night sight compatible model, the aforementioned D-48N. The D-48 never saw combat service with the Soviet military and was not meaningfully exported as it was generally found lackluster compared to the existing 100mm BS-3 gun. It was considered unable to effectively defeat contemporary medium tanks from the front, such as the M-48, and saw relatively minor service. The D-48 would, however, serve as the basis for several developments, notably lending its carriage to the 100mm smoothbore T-12 and the shell to the 85mm D70 on the ASU-85. The prime mover of the D-48 was the ATP tractor, or the ZIS-151 truck, and later the ZIL-157. The D-48 can be visually identified by the pepper pot muscle brake and the wavy top to the gun shield. The D-48N can be identified by the bulged panel in the gun shield in front of the night sight. The D-48 was an exceptionally small and light anti-tank gun for its performance, and so provides a reasonably effective and useful anti-tank capability against contemporary threats. However, by the mid to late 1950s, the 85mm caliber was starting to show its age. While it could defeat the M48 and Centurion frontally with full bore AP, it would have had issues with the M60A1 and the Chieftain. To rectify this, the D48 was issued with a heat FS round, quite similar to the high velocity heat FS round from the D44. The SD44 was a self-moving version of the 85mm D44 and saw relatively widespread service, with uh, around a thousand produced between 1954 and 57 in both day and night sight versions. The SD44 is largely identical to the D44, but has a third wheel and steering wheel on the trails, as well as a small engine and ammunition box. Despite the weight increase, this version is more mobile and is able to in-place and displace itself as well as transit the battlefield under its own power. The SD44 was mainly used by the VDV, though images exist of East German crews with this weapon.
The next 85mm gun in this seemingly never-ending procession of 85mm anti-tank and divisional guns is the 85mm VC-52, a Czechoslovakian equivalent to the D-44 that was produced in some numbers in the 1950s. It is, however, 300 kilos heavier than the D-44, and is larger with a longer caliber barrel, but has the same ballistic performance as the D-44. It was procured by Czechoslovakia and East Germany, and about 700 were produced from 1952 to 56. But by 1970, it was fully replaced in East German service as an anti-tank gun and howitzer by the 100mm T12 and 122mm D30, respectively. The visual identification of the 85mm VZ-52 is through the angled square gun shield, which is higher off the ground, as well as the larger axle on the mount. Honestly, visual identification of anti-tank guns, though, is usually through the muzzle flash, so just remember that the East German and Czech gun is angular and the Soviet one is wiggly. The big brother of the 85mm D44 is the 100mm BS-3 though it was introduced earlier. The BS-3 came about as a result of the mid-World War II upgrades to Soviet artillery and was a field gun rather than the more typical uh, Soviet designation of a divisional or core gun as it set between them in caliber. The BS-3 was based on the 100mm B-34 dual-purpose naval gun, and it began its development in the spring of 1943, entering mass production in May of 1944. Production ran through 1951, with a total of just under 4,000 guns made. The BS-3 was superseded by the late 1950s and early 1960s, as newer guns came online, notably the smoothbore 100mm T-12 anti-tank gun in 1961. Though out of mainline Soviet service in the 1960s, the BS-3 was very widely exported and saw action throughout the 20th century. The BS-3 is a semi-automatic breech 100mm gun with a 597 caliber barrel. It is equivalent in power and shares a cartridge with the D-10 series 100mm rifled tank gun. The 100mm full-bore armor-piercing ammunition available for the BS-3 should be effective against contemporary circa 1944-60 tanks at combat ranges, however Chieftain and M60A1 could prove difficult targets for the BS-3. Though some less reputable sources indicate that AT-10 Stabber anti-tank missiles were integrated onto BS-3 in the 80s, I found no concrete evidence to this effect. Visual identification of the BS-3 is best done through the two-chamber muzzle brake, dually wheel arrangement, four wheels on one axle, and the sharply angled gun shield with a relatively flat top. Introduced in 1960, one, the T-12 100mm anti-tank gun, na known to NATO as the M1955, was the first smoothbore artillery piece adopted en masse in the modern era. The T-12 was produced 1961-70 and replaced the 85mm D-48 and 100mm BS-3 field guns in Soviet service. The gun is incredibly powerful, with ammunition evolving over the service life to defeat threat armor until the mid-1980s. While there is potential for a very potent modern dart for it due to the extreme length of the casing, no such projectile exists because this gun type is broadly obsolete. The T-12 family was used by the Soviet Union and many Warsaw Pact states and is widely proliferated throughout the world to this day. The T-12 to a 19 gun was developed too and did replace the D-44, D-48, and BS-3 as the main towed anti-tank gun of the Soviet Army. The increase in caliber and shift to a smoothbore allowed a more effective anti-tank gun than the BS-3, despite weighing over 600 kilos less. The initial to a 19 100mm anti-tank gun T-12 came standard with a night sight and is very visually similar to the D-48, uh, with a similar muzzle brake carriage and gun shield. Compared to the D-48, though, the T-12 is noticeably heavier. Ammunition consists of a number of armor-piercing fin-stabilized discarding Sabo, high-explosive and high-explosive anti-tank rounds, which were able to defeat even very well-armored tanks such as M60A1 and Chieftain frontally, though not at as long range or as reliably as previous guns in relation to their contemporaries. Nonetheless, the T-12 was still able to satisfactorily fill its doctrinal role in Soviet service until the advent of the NATO box tanks. It is worth noting, though, that the Soviets produced depleted uranium long rod penetrators for the 100mm T-12 family of guns, which should on paper allow reliable defeat of NATO's box tanks of the 1980s to ranges of about 2 kilometers. The identification of the 100mm T-12 is best done through the very long 61 caliber, i.e. 6.1 meter, barrel, and the similar carriage from the 85mm D-48. The T-12 was found in dedicated anti-tank batteries, battalions, and regiments, and perhaps brigades from the 1960s onwards. A mix of towed anti-tank guns and anti-tank missile teams, or self-propelled anti-tank missile vehicles, was not inadvisable in this period. The T-12 gun was rated as far faster to emplace and displace than the Sager missile, and until the advent of thermals, a dug-in and camouflaged gun position was not easily combated, especially as there was no high-explosive frag round available 
available for the 105mm L7 gun. Range finding for the T12 series is accomplished through an off-mount laser rangefinder held at the battery level, as well as the 1RL125 ground surveillance radar. The T12 series were equipped with an evolving number of night sights, which enabled target identification and engagement under passive image intensification of night vision to 1,000 meters range. Introduced in 1970, the MT-12 is an upgrade to the T-12 that adds a torsion bar suspension to the carriage, but is otherwise largely the same. The new suspension and carriage is 350 kilos heavier, but greatly increases the operational and tactical mobility, and the new weight is offset by the addition of a seventh crew member. The MT-12 is best distinguished from the T-12 by the new gun shield that incorporates a gun mask to protect the gun at high elevation. The 1980s saw MT-12 upgraded to the MT-12R and MT-12K, which add the 1A31 Ruta all-weather radar sight and the AT-12 Swinger or 9K117 Casquettes missile system with 9M117M Khan missile respectively. The MT-12R has the Ruta radar sight, NATO reporting name unknown. This is very visible as there is a large hemispherical radar dish on the port wing of the gun shield. The millimeter wave radar based fire control system enables the MT-12R to fight day or night in all weather and allowed it to be quite adept on the defense in adverse conditions. However, by the mid-1980s, the 100mm gun and ammunition in service were running quite long in the tooth, and the collapse of the Soviet Union prevented further development of towed anti-tank guns that were not impractical messes. The MT-12K was incredibly rare in service, and required a separate laser illuminator to guide the missile. The Swinger was upgraded with a tandem warhead in the late 1980s, though very few were produced. Shifting from the excellent MT-12 back to weird Czechoslovakian and non-Soviet Warsaw Pact things, we have the 100mm VZ-53 anti-tank gun. The 100mm VZ-53, or Model 1953, is a Czechoslovakian anti-tank gun based on the same cartridge as the BS-3, but with a longer barrel. On balance, the gun adds over half a ton to gain 50 meters a second. Other than being longer, taller, heavier, and slightly more powerful, the VZ-53 is equivalent in performance to the BS-3. The Romanians developed the A407 gun, also known as the 100mm anti-tank gun M1975-77, which is broadly a BS-3 optimized for the anti-tank role in a shorter and lighter cartridge, but it, it's still larger and heavier than the MT-12, so I'm not sure what they were up to with that. Romania has a lot of very interesting decisions. Finally, we come to the 125mm 2A45 series. The 2A45 Sprut A and the 2A45M Sprut B, also known as the D-13 and SD-13. The D-13 series began as a late 1960s effort to improve Soviet-towed anti-tank gun effectiveness to a degree that would be sufficient to defeat Soviet perceptions of Chieftain and MBT-70s armor. D-13 was produced in very small numbers, so small that I can't actually find any photos of it, and SD-13 was produced in limited numbers for troop trials, and was ballistically identical to the 2A46M tank gun mounted on the carriage of a D-30 122mm howitzer. The 2A45M SD-13 Sprut B 125mm anti-tank gun on self-moving mount is best identified by the square gun shield, large single port muzzle brake, engine mounted in front of the gun shield, three trail carriage, the wheels off the ground when emplaced, and the barrel double as the tow hook. The 2A45M is equivalent in performance to the 2A46M, the gun from the T80U and T72B, but was not broadly adopted or produced in meaningful numbers. It was large, slow to emplace or displace, and the Soviets had realized that towed anti-tank guns were a losing proposition when you get into the 125mm performance band. Finally, we have the self-propelled mounts the Su-100P, an experimental post-war Soviet self-propelled anti-tank gun, saw very limited production, maybe a few dozen examples, but whose chassis would serve as the basis for a huge number of vehicles, including tracked mine layers, anti-aircraft guns, artillery systems, and radars, several of which we talked about today. The Su-12254, which is actually just the Su-122, though it's often called the Su-12254, so you don't confuse it with the World War II era Su-122, which is a T-54-derived casemate assault gun armed with a derivative of the 122mm gun off of the Soviet heavy tanks of the 1950s. Finally, we have the IT-122 and the IT-130, which were invented by the defector Nazi apologist and all-around desperate charlatan Vladimir Rezin, often known by his pen name of Viktor Suvorov. They're recognizable by their poor perspective work, subpar line work, uh, and off-white color. They are fictional and should be disregarded. Now, as this presentation comes to a close, I'm going to take a second to clarify some of the visual identification of some of the anti-aircraft and anti-tank systems in this guide. First, let's take a look at surface-to-air missiles. 
The SA-1 guild can be identified by the large triangular fins at the back with small frontal canards and a single stage missile. SA-2, however, has a pair of large triangular fins, one at the rear and one mid-body, alongside a two-stage design with a bit of a flare as the first stage transitions into the second. SA-3 has large square fins on the booster and smaller triangular fins midway up the missile with very small frontal canards, while SA-4 Ganef has two sets of large trapezoidal fins, four detachable boosters, and a large circular air intake at the nose. The fins are also offset 45 degrees from each other. SA-5 Gammon can be distinguished by its very large size and the four very large boosters, as well as the Delta small tail plan form similar to the AGM-65 Maverick or AIM-54 Phoenix missile. SA-6 can be identified by the four mid-body air intakes with small clipped triangular mid-body fins and then small fins at the rear, while SA-11 has four big long fins, also called strakes, running the length of the fuselage with small rear fins and no air intakes. Shifting to man pads, the initial SA-7 Grail has a cylindrical battery coolant bottle parallel to the launch tube, while SA-14 Gremlin switches to a sort of spherical battery coolant module also parallel to the launch tube. SA-16 Gimlet angles the battery coolant bottle, again spherical, and has a pointed front to the launch tube, while SA-18 Grouse has an inverted cone at the front of the launch tube and the same angled battery coolant bottle. From man pads, let's switch to identifying from overhead the static SAM sites. Perhaps the most identifiable Soviet static SAM site is the SA-2, best identified by the six launchers surrounding a fire control radar in a Star of David pattern. The typical launch site for an SA-3 is best identified by the usually four, but sometimes between three and six launchers in circular revetments splayed like the fingers off of a palm with the low blow radar in the palm of the hand. SA-5 sites are best identified first by their size, they are approximately the size of a small town, and have either two, three, or five launch areas with six trainable launchers each, with radar and missile service areas arrayed around the launchers. This SA-10A site is set up on an old SA-2 site and still has the remnants of the Star of David pattern left. Note that tin shield here has been replaced by cheese board, but their function is the same. Many SA-10A sites were set up in old SA-2 or SA-3 sites, as the SA-10A replaced these missiles in Soviet Air Defense Force service. This SAM unit and site converted from the SA-10A to the SA-21 in the late 2010s, and the difference in site arrangement is quite significant. In honesty, the actual arrangement of SA-10 family sites can be very low profile. There's no need for them to be in a particular arrangement, but this shows the typical parts a site contains. Launchers, fire control radars, and search radars. The ATGM BRDM variants are, as I mentioned earlier, really hard to tell apart. Here's the best ways that I've found to tell which is which. The BRDM-1 had three ATGM carrier variants, Snapper, Swatter, and Sagger. Snapper and Swatter have three missile rails, but different shaped missiles. Both have fold-flat roofs that split apart to reveal the missiles, while BRDM-1 Sagger has a slightly peaked roof over the ATGMs, six missile rails, and the roof elevates along with the launch rails. When the missiles are retracted, it can be very difficult to tell the ATGM BRDM-1 variants apart, but all are manual command line of sight missiles and effective against the targets they had to face on their contemporary battlefield of the 1960s. The BRDM-2 has no less than four ATGM carrier variants split across three missile families, Swatter, Sagger, and Spigot Spantral. First, BRDM-2 came in C-close and M-close swatter variants, differentiated by the rounded ATGM site and two front windows on the C-close variant, as opposed to flat ATGM site and one front window on the manual command line of sight swatter. The four missiles retract flush, and there's a radio dish between the launch rails. The C-close and M-close Sagger BRDM-2 variants are externally very similar to C-close and M-close Swatter BRDM-2 variants, with the main difference being the six Sagger missiles instead of four Swatter missiles and a radio dish. The flat verse rounded site housing and one verse two window differences are the same on Swatter and Sagger M-close and C-close launch vehicles. Remember, one window and round site is manual command line of sight, two windows and rounded site, 
means semi-active command line of sight. Finally, the BRDM2 Spigot Spandrel has two full-size front windows and a small square ATGM sight above the gunner's position on the front. It also has five retractable Spigot or Spandrel missile tubes. That wraps up our overview of the anti-aircraft and anti-tank systems of the Soviet Army. Thank you for watching, and again, don't forget to subscribe and like and comment and everything. I hope you enjoyed, and get ready to strap in for another doozy of a video for part four, Rocket Forces and Artillery. It's not coming for a few months, but you should probably start preparing preparing yourself now. Stay hydrated, and I'll see you next time.